I will introduce um, uh, Professor Ken Goodson. Uh, Ken, oh yes, okay, he is here. So uh, Professor Ken Goodson is a chair professor at in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. He is also the senior associate dean for faculty and academic affairs in the School of Engineering. Um, he has been honored um, with the uh, uh, ASME Cross Medal. He is the uh, recipient of IEEE Richard Chu Award and uh, American and also the uh, SRC Aristotle Award. And uh, he is going to speak to us today about uh, thermal science in uh, heterogeneous future. So Ken, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I'm delighted uh, the <laughs> heterogeneity of the semiconductor industry and its products is generated lots of great research uh, for uh, my students and my research group and the collaborations we have with so many great companies. And um, I just want to acknowledge that we've worked with so many companies over the years, just over, uh, uh, you, you know, when I started at Stanford in 1994, we were getting help from Intel and IBM, but now it's a, a broad portfolio of great companies, Google and automotive companies, Toyota, Bosch, Electronics, uh, and it's pervasive, the, uh, the, uh, the, the challenges and uh, the ubiquity of, of these heterogeneous platforms. And I'd also like to say that the heterogeneity, uh, as has been pointed out uh, in this conference and also in others on this topic, it's at multiple scales. So you have heterogeneity of system level components that are being integrated. You also have uh, heterogeneity of different types of components in the chip scale and materials that enable those uh, really at the chip and the device scale. And all of these are very exciting areas for electrical engineering, but also packaging and also thermal management research. Of course, additional features are extreme dimensions. And as always, um, we have disruptive fits that play a role. Um, so uh, Bill uh, Chen actually, <laughs> I was late, I'm kind of buried in administrative work helping people get back on campus. Uh, Bill actually said, uh, why don't you talk about thermal science in the heterogeneous future, uh, giving a fundamental slant and flavor to the, to the talk. And I think that's a great idea. And so that's the talk I put together for this morning um, to give kind of a, the foundations that are moving and helping us as we struggle with these new geometries, new integration uh, challenges. So I've broken it into uh, materials and interface engineering, and then things that are going on around embedded microfluidics, which is aiming to get to really high rates of heat transfer. And then uh, some of the metrology, micro nano thermal characterization work that's going on. So disruptive physics, this is actually a wonderful image, dates back already 10 years of a FinFET. Uh, I think many of us focused early on on the failure of Fourier's law in small dimensional structures and much has been published there. We've written some nice papers uh, and there are new physics of that realm. The, the new physics that we're struggling with today have to do with somewhat more mundane things. Uh, and for that, I'm showing this uh, sh uh, slide from a recent student uh, paper that we have and we recently published this in uh, ACS uh, applied materials and interfaces, basically showing that surface preparation has an enormous impact, factor of two almost, on the thermal resistance between deposited films on silicon. And we'd always known that these resistances uh, were so significant. They're very difficult to measure, but they piled up over many stacked interfaces in a semiconductor circuit, particularly as you scale down dimensions and scale up powers, has a dramatic impact on temperature distributions. And it comes down to how many of the bonds in our, in our uh, processing are covalent and how many are actually van der Waals type uh, forces it has a big impact on thermal conduction. And so this is a 
disruptive physics that has to do with the intimate relationship between processing details and factor of two levels of thermal resistance as we try to get heat across interfaces in stacked thin film systems. And they're everywhere. This is a, a slide credit of uh, Muhammad Bakir from Georgia Tech that he prepared for a recent ascent, uh, SRC ascent review. You know, the fully monolithic future where everything is essentially monolithically integrated. Um, all the calculations are done without the boundary resistances that I alluded to in the previous slide. And all those parasitic uh, resistances stack up and get bigger as we uh, uh, integrate and get smaller and have higher power densities. So the, the three-step process that Muhannad lays out here uh, from uh, multi-chip packages, a heterogeneous system to a all on a package subtract heterogeneous to fully integrated uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, actually elevate the challenge and the complexity and the disruptive physics involved in understanding boundary resistances. So the work that we do in my group spans uh, servers and portables that are, I like to think of these as, um, as electronics that, that think basically that work on um, you know, trying to understand and, and process information, uh, everything from microprocessors and the and the the power densities that we struggle with there are at the megawatts per centimeter squared at the device level, all the way out to kind of a hundred watts uh, and above uh, at the per centimeter squared at the microprocessor core. Now, there are a lot of interesting strategies to cool a fully integrated three-dimensional chip. This is a paper that, uh, that we co-authored together with some really bright people in electrical engineering at Stanford and, and Berkeley a few years back on uh, ways to bring in thermal storage to happen, happen, handle rapid transients, also uh, to have aggressive convection solutions around the perimeter of the device, and then the efficient heat removal uh, 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 between layers using a through through uh, uh, wafer interconnects, fluidic and otherwise. Very complex visionary paper. Um, and that's actually uh, part of what's going on in this SRC jump ascent. I know some people on the call here at Zoomhar are participating. I want to give uh, credit to Professor Suman Dada, Notre Dame, the director. But you see that there's a, in this center, there's vertical CMOS. And then there's uh, also heterogeneous CMOS. Uh, and both of these have highlighted integrated thermal management. So that's really embedded thermal management as a key deliverable where we're working with uh, partners in electrical engineering to try and make progress. In addition, um, there's a whole level of power density associated with power electronics, which is getting much, much more attention these days uh, with the efficiency of uh, electric and hybrid vehicles uh, which have power conversion challenges and power density challenges. Also power MOSFETs and a number of military applications uh, have very high power density demands. These generally operate at a higher heat flux, both at the device level and at the system level uh, or, uh, and require actually uh, many, and in some ways have actually uh, predicted uh, the, uh, some of the challenges that we're seeing for, for monolithic integration. And for that work, I actually want to give special credit to another center director, uh, Professor Andrew Lean, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's led now for almost six years, uh, the center of which we're a part, that focuses specifically on thermal management and electrical uh, man management of these power systems. And the POETS, pro it's, it's power optimized electrothermal systems. That's where the POETS comes from. It spans materials and devices to very fundamental research to components and subsystems where you actually have uh, individual devices that are uh, interacting with uh, moving drivetrain parts and then test beds that are full level uh, systems. So we're interacting with people who are builders also interacting with people who are developing novel materials for heat transfer. So let me step back a minute and talk about embedded cooling and the materials that have enabled it. So this looks back to the IBM thermal conduction module, uh, the work that Dick Chu and others did back in the 80s, some of the very first fluidic cooling and got a lot of attention because it was able to be quite aggressive in removing heat. And nowadays, of course, we have uh, this image of a modern Google server, server blade with integrated cooling. 
uh, and we'd have to talk to Madhu and others to see how ubiqu ubiquitous that is, but it's clearly part of the future. And um, the, in the middle there is a uh, very large heat sink that we designed and developed for cooling the uh, Apple G5 in the 2005 and six time frame when I started the company. So nowadays, the integration and the embedding is getting more interesting and exotic. And so this shows a trajectory that we pursued together with uh, Toyota under uh, the POETS uh, program, where we actually were helping them explore different levels of integration. And the, if you have a power converter and you're a power transistor, the, the easiest thing to do would be down here concept C, where you actually have uh, microfluidics that are bonded with a TIM and metallization to the power transistor. Of course, you lose a lot of the benefit because you have to conduct the heat across this interface. Uh, the other concept was to have the device and then to bond, uh, uh, to make the microchannel within the electrode. And that's better because the electrodes in, in very intimate thermal contact with the power transistor. But of course, the home run play, the big play of course, is to embed the fluidics in the silicon device. And the benefit of that, of course, is there's no interfaces at all. You have direct uh, translation. And so we did a, we actually built the prototype C and we're working on B and scaling up and indicating the benefits of A. And so when we say embedded cooling, we're really talking about concept A uh, for the application. And it's the real deal here. Here's another nice slide. Uh, I'll credit to Mahanit from Georgia Tech, where he's done a nice job of illustrating how a fully integrated embedded cooling scheme might be where there's actually a traditional heat sink with fluidic cooling at the top here. You've got uh, RAM memory, you have chiplets that are integrated of different types, you have memory tier. And then of course you have embedded fluidic microchannels. And I'll say back in the day when I started a company and we, we were cooling the uh, you know, products for Apple, the, the dream that I had back then was that we would build fluidic heat sinks that had optimized fluid delivery for the power maps of IBM and, and Intel microprocessors. And of course, IBM and Intel were not really eager to give us that information because it was part of their proprietary leverage. And so that was not actually uh, something we were able to do. But what this enables, what Muhammad has drawn here is you can very definitely route the fluid precisely to where it's needed to aggressively cool the chiplet or the most powerful parts of the chip. And so the, the main optimization here that, that's, that's taking place is that you're able to really dedicate the fluid delivery uh, to the regions of the chip where it's most needed. Of course, there are challenges in fabrication, of course, and that brings me to materials. So um, what do we make heat sinks out of? Now, of course, <laughs> if, if it's a silicon device, silicon is a pretty, pretty good material. It's got a reasonably high conductivity, and there are reasons why you, you would do that. But there are a variety of re ways that you can improve heat transfer in a fluidic device using advanced materials or novel materials. Or you could take advantage of manufacturing uh, processes that are maybe less challenging to save cost. And so I wanted to talk a bit about that. So yeah, I like to put things on a regime map. So this is a regime map where we're showing the dimension um, of the sample. and. Um, we're also showing the uh, thermal conductivity on the y-axis. I just want to make sure everyone can still hear me. I'm, I'm just uh, on the, uh, don't have my screen up. Is my- uh, Thank you. I'm good. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but I just wanted to kind of plot here on this regime map, what we've got, uh, uh, you maybe have, let me get rid of this real quick. Um, you have a, um, surface coatings that can pr promote and improve convection. You also have porous metals. You have uh, the opportunity for diamond as a high thermal conductivity material, silicon carbide, uh, metal, microfluidics, manifolding. There are a variety of different materials. They have different thermal conductivities and they can play a role in helping you uh, cool and the device. And there are different ways that these are made. We use oxidation, nanopolymerization, organic additive manufacturing, molding and adhesion, electrodeposition, tooled machining. So the 
the, the traditional processes that are used for the semiconductors, the photolithography and etching are being complemented by a variety of techniques as we uh, explore some of these heterogeneous integrated structures. And that actually uh, is a big part of some of the most innovative solutions. So this slide is credit to um, actually uh, um, Justin Weibel at Purdue, uh, who uh, collaborated for many years with Suresh Garamella. And he and his students uh, did this great job of making surfaces with variable wettability. And as we explore two-phase flow, one of the most exciting things is that by changing the wettability, we can have better control of the formation of the vapor phase and actually improve the heat transfer coefficient and the stability of the flow. I don't want you to fully digest all this. I just am saying that by surface engineering is a route to have a big impact on the total temperature rise in a microfluidic heat sink. Uh, and this is a, a more, I would say, practical implementation from the Georgia Tech team, Yogi Yoshi, Muhammad, uh, who actually built layers in a stacked die using pin fins and showed aggressive convection cooling in a geometry that actually looks a lot like what one might see in some of the images I showed of a monolithic circuit. And they achieved a high, relatively high rates of heat transfer uh, in a silicon integrated structure with staggered pin fins. Um, my own group actually has spent a lot of time trying to, to build the very, very best uh, heat transfer for, for performance using at times exotic materials and challenging fabrication techniques. And one of the real mechanisms that's it's kind of the land, the hallmark of, of how we do this is we think about how do you deliver the liquid to the surface and remove the vapor uh, so that it doesn't get in the way and uh, uh, wicking structures, such as those shown at the left, which bring the liquid phase in, are a key part of that. Or porous structures, and I'm showing here a, a copper inverse opal structure that we've been working with for some time, which is essentially an opal is a periodic array of spheres. An inverse opal is when you uh, remove these spheres and you have uh, metal everywhere else. And we were able to get to uh, 1.2 kilowatts per centimeter squared, with a very modest temperature rise through very aggressive convection. This shows a nice image of some of these inverse opals and we can control the neck dimensions as well as the diameters of the pores, et cetera. Now, um, the uh, precision micro nano fab that actually uh, has been made available from our material science colleagues, actually there are ways to fabricate uh, these uh, structures using borrowing techniques from photonic crystals or photoanodes, porous electrodes, basically sacrificial techniques uh, where you actually uh, use two photons to process a polymer uh, and or where you use electrodeposition around a sacrificial material. It, the materials fabrication end of things has gone way ahead of what we in the heat transfer community are using at present to enhance heat transfer in microfluidic systems. And so, for example, we actually have demonstrated, this is a Chun Wing Wu from my group, uh, that you can get very, very low conduction resistance in a porous wick, and you can engineer and control the pore size. And furthermore, you can control the dimensions of the neck, which give you actually very good fluidic transport and adhesion of the liquid film to the, uh, to the surface and can promote very, very effective boiling. Uh, these, this is one route and it uh, basically gives you your cake and allows you to eat it too because a, a traditional copper screen or centered copper particles, this is old school heat transfer, have a large thermal resistance uh, and they give you a low permeability, but the, the penalty is a large temperature rise. And with some of these structures uh, vertically aligned uh, inverse opals, we can achieve uh, simultaneously a low resistance and a, a reasonably high permeability. Um, I wanna give credit here to uh, uh, Avi Bar Cohen who passed way too soon, uh, passed away recently. He was a leader in the thermal science community and the uh, electronics packaging community for many years and actually a mentor personally to me, uh, helped me enter the field in the 90s. Uh, Avi was a director, program director at DARPA at a key time and he launched programs that encouraged many of us to explore um, the limits 
of conduction and convection cooling from uh, power electronic devices. And those programs yielded a ton of great results, which are having fallout in a big way for heterogeneous systems. And I'll just give you an example from my own work. I'm showing some of the people from my uh, lab who played a role uh, or, or collaborators, including Dave Altman at Raytheon, Debbie Sineski, Professor Vero Astro, and former postdocs, Yunjin Wan, Domena Aganafer, and James Palko, and uh, adjunct professor Meti Shagi. The idea was to explore all the ways you could make a heat sink to cool a gallium nitride hemp that was generating 100 kilowatts per centimeter squared. And we did it four different ways with collaborators ranging from Boeing to Nubotronics to uh, uh, Raytheon. And the one case we actually built the heat sink in silicon carbide, which is the substrate material below the hemp. In other case, we made it using fluid optimized routing and copper. And then uh, another case, we made a, a porous structure and we laid that porous structure inside uh, etched diamond channels that Raytheon can produce using a laser uh, etching technique. And so they made microfluidic channels from diamond. I call this the uh, $2 million heat sink because we made a couple of them and you can figure out how much money we got. Um, but they were incredibly high performance and got us uh, enormous rates of heat transfer and explored the limits uh, and, and were able to control the phase. So we built all of these with these different collaborators. And if, <laughs> that was 2015, 2016, but the, uh, what, you, what you see now is that we're actually leveraging all of the learnings in particular the porous copper and porous metals for much more mundane heat sinks that are going into uh, Ford and Toyota and prototypes that we're working on also in calculations for uh, Google and Intel. So this shows actually diamond uh, and etched diamond uh, with the porous copper on it and an artist's rendition of the actual heat sink that we built and then an actual picture of it there and the data are in the literature. One thing we're doing together with ARPA-E and I wanna give credit to uh, Michael Ohadi who kind of launched this program. Uh, Mike also a, a visionary leader in, in routing research for heat transfer. He's returning to his uh, professorship role soon. Uh, but basically, uh, if you can take a, the work that we did at kind of the uh, you know, fraction of a centimeter scale, and then uh, look at what we did scaling up to larger devices at high performance, uh, if you can take that and scale it up to larger and larger dimensions without increasing the resistance, you can have an enormous impact both for power electronics, but also for data centers, because the, the thing that we're observing and our friends in the, uh, uh, at these companies that, that handle the data centers, the power demands and the power density demands are actually converging between power electronics. I mean, all of these technologies are now pushing the limits uh, and they're pushing them together towards the values that the heat transfer community can deliver. And so if we could actually scale up the performance that we did demonstrated at smaller scales in terms of resistance to larger scales, it'll have a big impact. Turns out there are two major challenges with that. The first is fluid routing. And that's the way that you deliver the fluid to the chip. And so if you have access to the backside, a three-dimensional hierarchical network, much like we have for the human body and the capillary distribution system, that's the way it's done. Of course, if, you're, if you have a cooling layer embedded in a monolithic chip, you don't have the flexibility to scale in the same way. So this really applies best for world-class heat sinks that are attached to the exterior of a component. The other challenge, of course, is interface materials. And this is a night chart that uh, Mehdi Ashegi, who works with me and my students, put together. And so this shows the world-class heat sinks that have been built and our efforts to scale them out to very low thermal resistance. And then it shows actually um, the thermal resistances that have uh, and are possible from uh, different types of greases and gels or double, uh, you know, some of the exotic material that worked on in the past carbon nanotubes or indium solders, which are industry standard now. But you note actually that these, these attachments all yield thermal resistances, which are a pretty big parasitic uh, effect on a world-class performing heat exchanger. If we can take this heat exchanger and build it out here, and then we have a grease or a gel, or even an indium solder, we're going to triple the thermal resistance or double it. Uh, add, an, add it, we're going to triple it in total. 
Uh, and so that really means that we, to leverage the benefits, we need to work hard on advanced uh, uh, interface material solutions. And we've had a, a number of projects in that over the years. And the most productive, I would say by far, has been nanowire copper-based uh, attachments, which give you the flexibility you need to accommodate uh, CTE mismatch and still give you relatively high uh, thermal conductance. I'm not going to say much more about that, but I just want to underscore the importance of interface materials. And that brings me to the last topic today, which is the importance of uh, measurements. And the, the best mentors I've had over the years from industry and also academia, Avi Bar Cohen, who's uh, passed, but uh, these people have said, you know, one of the best things we can do in the academic world is work on measurement tools uh, to, to really nail down the properties that industry is trying to sort out. And in fact, that is what we've done over the year. And I often chart this on sample complexity. So we've, we've built one-off measurements where we measure the thermal conductivity along a ultra thin platinum interconnect or, or aluminum interconnect down to uh, several Langstrom's thick to, to understand the physics to measuring the thermal conduction through deposited films uh, using optical methods to, to do that or using very exotic methods to, to understand how the, the properties evolve if they're subjected to uh, process conditions such as a battery in here in the top right. And uh, just to bring you back, I showed this plot early on. I said, look, um, the nucleation layer that one uses in the fabrication process of deposited films has a big impact on the thermal resistance. It turns out that a decade ago, I wouldn't have known how to perform this measurement, either optically or thermally. I mean, this is how I, the bread and butter of, of my research group, we make these measurements, but it's such a low thermal resistance that we're dealing with, but it's high enough to be very important. And so uh, a student came along and, and had a really clever idea, uh, a way to amplify the thermal resistance by having the heat, instead of going into a contiguous film and going through into the substrate, having the heat go through a grating. And the grating actually, of course, will, will have the boundary resistance in it to it, but the total heat load will be much higher. So the signal will be measured up here, but the thermal resistance will be essentially made larger by the lower areas through which it is acting. And so this is a way of amplifying the signal. And it was able, it was what allowed uh, Hyung Gun Kwan, the student, uh, to make uh, some really exciting measurements of these resistances, which I've reported on the previous page. And that's exactly the kind of thing that's happened year after year is that the students have come up with a really clever ways to make the measurements. Here's another example. This is another diamond is another low resistivity material, but its properties have a big impact. This is a artist rendering of a grain boundary. And you can see here the grain boundary and the, the, what's going on in terms of heat conduction there. That's interesting. Aditya Sud was with my group at the time. And he's like, well, I wanna measure how that impacts heat conduction. And so he developed a scanning optical technique, time domain thermal reflectance scanning over the sample surface. And here's the electron backscattering showing the thermal conductivity as a function of position, uh, you know, and it's uh, uh, changing. Um, and you get uh, different levels of the uh, um, of watt per meter Kelvin in the interior of a grain. Whereas when you approach the edge of a grain, you end up with lower values of the conductivity because the phonons that are, are transporting through the grains are scattering those interfaces. Very elegant measurement. And he was able to quantify how that scattering works. And that scanning technique actually very innovative and challenging to put together. Another thing he did, and this is also relevant, some of these materials go through uh, transitions during the fabrication process. This is not directly relevant for heterogeneous circuits, but it's just such an exciting measurement. I wanted to show it. This is basically a battery material where you have molybdenum disulfide and you have lithium ions going in for storage and they migrate in and out and it changes the thermal conductance. And so uh, he was able to put together a measurement where he was able to watch the thermal conductance change as the battery was storing charge basically. And it was an order of uh, magnitude change in the thermal conductivity. Uh, I, I have no uh, illusion that this is going to work, but in case the image comes across, you can actually see the thermal conductance evolving. I have no idea if this is going to come across the zoom, but you can see the thermal conductance evolving as you change the voltage and drive the battery into storage and depletion mode. Very neat stuff. So um, with that, I'm wrapping up. I want to thank our, our uh, corporate sponsors and uh, uh, also 
our uh, government sponsors. We've had a lot of help over the years from DARPA, in particular the time when, when Avi, the late Avi Barcohen was leading there. We've had great help from NSF through the Poets Center, Air Force, and ARPA-E, a big sponsor right now, and ONR historically has been a great support, so DOE. I'd like to acknowledge my students. The current group has a, a number of really talented people who are, uh, are graduating uh, in the near future and a, a really great cohort from the past. Who are many faculty and many with the industry. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Ken. As always, uh, uh, interesting topics and very uh, motivated uh, talk for us. Uh, my question here about uh, Macro channels and uh, the industry way we try to move, which already been circulated in 1970. We have as liquid inside the silicon. Uh, Intel patent was uh, exist in that, and uh, it is circulated many times. If I'm looking to one of uh, there is a good, very good report uh, available, which uh, coming from uh, DARPA 2020, just to be released last year from Georgia Tech, and they did very interesting experiment, which is they did uh, macro etching uh, inside the silicon, uh, and they put it the name of the package Startic 10, and. What they found that uh, the gradient across the silicon is still 20 degree and uh, 20 degree and the power flux is still like 55 watt per centimeter square, not even hundred. So is it really will be coming now? And even they double the pressure to three BSI, BSI and the gradient is still 12 uh, degree across the silicon with this moderate 55 watt per centimeter square. Is the macro channel not the right way in approach been implemented? Is it the silicon architecture? Or should we have something different? If really this real experiment and real stuff, which DARBA already make it an opportunity available and uh, already been testing, already been done and giving this kind of result. What do you think? You pose a very important question that fluidic, Heat transfer coefficients are high in microfluidics, but if you have a really high heat flux locally, the, the heat needs to be spread aggressively in order to avoid a, a large temperature rise. In other words, uh, if, if you just go straight from a transistor at a megawatt per centimeter squared into a fluidic channel, you're gonna have an enormous temperature drop. You have to spread in a material, silicon or otherwise, before that happens. So the placement of the fluidics is, is really, really uh, the question. And I think the, the, the challenge that you pose is, you know, do we put the fluidics in the system uh, or do we put aggressive lateral spreading, what we call a thermal ground plane in the system, which are very high performance thermal conduction materials or, Something else we've been working on, I didn't talk about much, are taking the uh, vapor chamber technology to its theoretical limits, where you have, instead of a uh, vapor chamber that's you know a millimeter thick, we have something that's uh, 20, 30 microns thick and achieves a very aggressive uh, isothermal condition across the chip, spreading the heat aggressively and helping minimize the temperature uh, rise that you, that you um, referred to. And that exactly, I mean, your question, really part of the heterogeneous future, we can develop the thermal science to do these things, but it's gonna take clever engineering to use these tools in the right way to minimize the overall temperature rise. So there will be conduction or vapor chamber type devices that we can embed. There'll be channels that we can embed. There'll be external heat sinks. And then we're, we're always to the laws of physics, of course, ultimately, we have to actually accrue these temperature gradients uh, in the materials that we're using for the system. So a lot of clever engineering, a lot of use of the right tools in the right places. And we're the day when we'll have a cookbook solution. You know, I, I never forget my first visit to Intel in the 90s, where well, here's the heat sink that all of our vendors have to use, and we test them, and it's all the same, and, and everything's the same across this interface. Those days are over because the heterogeneous system has different power levels and different parts. If you integrate monolithically, it puts a lot more work uh, for the thermal engineer working with the electrical engineer to fabricate and optimize all of this. 
anyway, I hope that addresses some of what you were after. Absolutely, yeah. I think, thank you very much, Ken. So have you looked at advanced thermal materials with high thermal conductivities and low CTEs like diamond particle silver? Yeah, so we've spent a lot of time. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Carl. Um, so the this whole idea of how do you build a good heat conductor that's got the right CTE properties has been a long passion of mine and some of my students. So either you match the, the CTE with silicon or you try to build a TIM uh, uh, that has a very, very low uh, uh, Young's modulus so it can uh, accommodate differences. Um, so diamond particles or silver particles embedded in meshes, we have made measurements in that. And it's really, really tricky to put an amazing conductor in a, in a, in a poor conductor and get anything that's worth having. And the reason for that is that the, the amazing conductor, these are essentially isothermal, and then there are boundary resistances and they distribute themselves non-uniformly. So the best, so for years I was pushing the idea of carbon nanotubes because they have enormous thermal conductivity, but we learned the hard way that they rapidly get damaged and the thermal conductivity demands the exquisite quality of that material to, to stay high. So we went quickly in the past five or six years to uh, metal nanowires, which have pretty good thermal conductivities and uh, in, can be built and are incredibly robust. You can uh, in, infiltrate them with uh, a stabilizing gel. But the, the key here is that that material touches both sides of the material. So you, the heat is routed directly through the metal and doesn't have to actually go through the particles. So um, I, I may not, Carl, I may not know the specific material you're referring to, but it's a, a, an area that we've looked at really hard and, and we've kind of asymptote towards these forests of metals, nanometals. I hope that helps. Um, have you considered applying uh, for time on the DOE light sources to perform these kinds of measurements. There are a number of beam lines that can do the surface reflectometry and nanoscale imaging. Well, this of course is a great, great point. And also we have Slack here uh, at Stanford. Uh, I think we have uh, tapped into uh, Slack, uh, but the main focus for these has been super exciting work where we're trying to understand actually the types of phonons and their distributions because of course the uh, energy levels and the time scales that are accessible on the, on the DOE instrumentation are truly exciting. And so some work uh, that we've got going in that domain is actually trying to visualize the transient behavior of the, of the phonon uh, propagation in a way that we can't use, do using more traditional lasers that we can have in the lab. So that's of course a wonderful guidance and I appreciate it. 